So you're running Linux servers in your home lab environment, and they're performing various tasks. And they might be virtualized or they might be bare metal. And before I assign any tasks or workloads to my Linux servers, there's a few things I do first. Hey, welcome back. So I'm Techno Tim, and today we're going to talk about the first things I do when setting up a new Linux server. As a quick reminder, I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So if you want to continue the conversation about setting up some Linux servers there, we can. So let's talk about the first things I do when I set up my Linux servers. So the first most obvious one is picking your Linux distribution. For me, it's typically Ubuntu server, but most of the things we covered today will apply to any Linux distribution. And because the ideas and principles carry over to most Linux distributions. Some people have asked how I set up my servers, some of the utilities I use, and some of the processes I use. And so I figured I'd share it with all of you and maybe get some feedback. So as we walk through these steps, Feel free to let me know in the comments section if I did something wrong or different, because I definitely value your feedback. And so with that out of the way, let's get started. So the first thing you're going to need, obviously, is a Linux server. As I mentioned before, I choose Ubuntu, but the Linux distribution is up to you. Most of these commands will work, with the exception of some packages we install. But you'll just have to swap out the package manager command for your distribution. And worth noting, during installation, I didn't choose to install an SSH server or configure automatic updates. And you'll see why here in a little bit. And so the very first thing I do is update my installation. First I run an app-get update, then I run an app-get upgrade. And this will upgrade our packages. Also worth noting, I installed the latest version available for Ubuntu. If you didn't and you want to upgrade your release, you might want to do a release upgrade. And this may take some time depending on the release you used when you installed it. And after that, we'll reboot our server. The next thing I do is configure automatic updates for security. Now I know that there are some risks involved with installing upgrades automatically, but there are also risks with not patching my servers with security updates automatically. So I feel like the benefits of patching my server with automatic security updates outweighs the risk of not. So here's how we set it up. First, you'll want to make sure that you have unintended upgrades installed. And you can see, it's already installed for me. So we'll need to reconfigure this. So we'll reconfigure the package. I'll say no here. I'll say yes here. And so now it's reconfigured. And we can check the work by editing this config file. And here, this is what I'm looking for. No, we don't want this to automatically reboot, so we won't add the flag here. And a quick call out here, the unintended upgrade 1 means it will happen daily which is what we want. And so we can close out of here. Next on my list is create a new account and add it to the sudoers list and disable root while we're at it. Worth mentioning, Ubuntu does this for me, but I'll walk you through the process just to verify. First, we'll want to do sudo add user, not techno Tim, and this would be your username you want to create. Next, you want to provide a secure password. Then you want to verify your secure password. Next, you can add a name if you like and some additional information if it applies to you. Then you'll verify it. And now we have our account. Next, we'll want to add this user to the sudoers list so we can use sudo. This is as simple as using user mod to modify our user. Once we've added that user to the list, we can see if that user has sudo privileges. And after we run that command, we can see that our user, not techno Tim, the one we just created, can run all commands. So this means our new account can use sudo. And here, if we grab for root, we'll see our root account. We can use sudo pass wd l root to disable logins for our root account. And after that, if you try to log in with your root account, you won't be able to. The next thing I do is install SSH. Now I know some distributions will ask you this during the installation, but I'm gonna cover it just in case you chose no. And so we'll install OpenSSH server. And after that, you should be able to SSH into your server. Now, before we SSH in, you have a couple of options. One, you can use password-based authentication. This will allow you to use a username and password when SSHing in. Or you can set up SSH keys and use key-based authentication. This is really going to be up to you, but I'll show you how to set up key-based authentication. First, we'll run SSH keygen. Then it will ask if we want to save this in the default location. Here, you can choose to add a passphrase. Then you'll confirm the passphrase. To create a new pair, first you'll go to your client machine. Now this is the machine you're going to use to SSH into your server, not your server right now. So from your client machine, you'll want to run ssh-keygen. Here it will prompt you for where to save your new key. Now be careful, if you have one there already, it's going to overwrite it. 
but it will prompt you before it does. And I don't have one already, so it's going to ask me to create a passphrase for this key. Then we'll confirm our passphrase, then it will generate a key pair. Next, we'll want to copy our key to the server. I use ssh-copy-id. So the syntax is ssh-copy-id and then our username at our host name. And this is telling us it doesn't recognize the remote host, so we'll just hit enter here. Next, we'll enter our password for that new account we created. And it copied our key over. And now we should be able to SSH into our server just using our key. And here we go. So now we're SSH'd in. Now we should probably disable password-based authentication since we're using a key. And so the file we'll want to edit is etc ssh sshd underscore config. Make sure it's D for the daemon, otherwise you'll be modifying the client. And in here, we're looking for a setting called password authentication yes. So let's uncomment it and add no. Another line that I've had to add is challenge response authentication is also no. After saving that, we'll want to restart SSH. And then from another machine that doesn't have your SSH key, try SSHing in. And right away, you'll see we're denied. So this is a good sign. This means that our SSH server is no longer accepting passwords and only SSH keys. The next thing I do is set a static IP for my server. Now, I actually choose the belt and suspenders approach to this. I set a static IP on the server as well as reserve it in the DHCP scope. Now that might be overkill, but I wanna make sure that my DHCP server doesn't hand out that address. And I know I could address that with scopes. And also I wanna make sure that my server IP never changes. So I do it in both places, but here's how we do it on the server. First, I run IPA to look at my IP address. You can see it's 192.168.0.167. Next, I'll modify this YAML file. Here, I'm gonna change a couple of things. First, I'm gonna change DHCP4 to no, it was yes. Next, on this addresses list, I'm gonna specify my IP address that I want it to be. And this is 192.168.0.222. Next, we'll set the gateway, which is the gateway for the subnet. Then in name servers under addresses is another list. This is our name server list or our DNS list. Here, I'm gonna use 192.168.0.4. So we'll save this file and we'll close out. Next, we're gonna apply this setting. So it's sudo net plan apply. And you might be thinking, uh, it didn't work. Well, that's because we just got disconnected from our SSH session since we have a new IP address. So let's SSH again using the new IP. And now we're back in. We run IPA again. Now you can see our new IP address. Now the next thing I do is more of a quality of life fix. Now I know Bash is a perfectly fine shell, but I really prefer Z shell. And with that, I use oh my zish or oh my zsh. So that's typically the next thing I install. So first I update my repositories, then I install zsh, then I install some additional fonts, then I install this curl command which installs oh my zish or oh my zsh. Then it will prompt to see if we want to switch our shell, which we do. Supply our password, and now we're running all my ZSH. As I mentioned before, Bash is perfectly fine. I've just become accustomed to Z Shell. Plus, all my ZSH has a ton of plugins that are helpful as you're navigating the terminal. Now, here's something that might be specific to Ubuntu. For whatever reason, the default partitioning for Ubuntu is kind of odd. They don't use the entire LVM. And so here's a few commands I run to use our entire disk. First, we'll run sudo LVM. Next, we're gonna run LVM extend along with some additional parameters. And this will use all of our free space. Then you should see it extend. After that, we'll exit out. Then we'll run resize 2fs to resize the volume. Then you should get a success output. Now, I'm not sure why Ubuntu does this, but I've had to run this on a lot of machines. Hopefully they fix this in the future. Next, I set or change my host name. As you can see here, my host name is Ubuntu. Or you can run hostname CTL to see more information about this. So to change our host name, we can run sudo hostname CTL set dash hostname and then our host name. And if we run hostname CTL again, we should see our new host name. Now, there's one more place we need to change it, and I usually forget this. And that's in our Etsy hosts. So let's modify that. And here, you'll see our old name right here in the host entry. So let's change it. And there we go, new host name. Next is something I rarely have to do, but I check anyways, and that's setting our proper time zone. If we run time date CTL, we should see our time zone. Mine's America slash Chicago. If we want to change our time zone, we could list all the time zones here with list dash time zones. And we'll see a lot of time zones. But let's say for instance, we wanted to change our time zone to a different one to say America slash Anchorage. We would use this command right here, sudo time date ctl 
set dash time zone, and then our time zone. Then we can check our time zone again by running time date CTL, and we can see it's set to Anchorage. But I'm gonna change my back because I'm in America slash Chicago. And that's just as easy as running the same command again with the new time zone. And speaking of time and time zones, Another thing I do is make sure that my NTP time server is set properly. So if we run systemctl status systemd timesyncd, we should see the output of our configuration. Now it looks like it's configured for ntp.ubuntu.com, which is an external source. I have an NTP time server here internally, so I'm going to set it to that. So we'll edit at c systemd timesyncd.com. And here in this configuration, we'll see this NTP attribute that's commented out. Let's uncomment that and put in our time server. And we'll save it. Now we'll stop the service, then we'll turn it back on. Then we'll run the same command to check it. And now we see it synchronizing with our own time server. Now the next thing I do only applies to virtual machines. And that's installing the guest agent to connect to our virtual server. Now I'm using Proxmox. And if we look at this guest, we can see right here under IPs, no guest agent configured. This is because we don't have the QEMU agent installed. Now the QEMU agent provides more information than just an IP, but here's how we get it installed. First, you'll want to make sure that in options, the QEMU guest agent is turned on. Here, we'll say OK. Next, we'll run an update. Then we'll run sudo app get install QEMU dash guest dash agent. Then our agent should be installed. Next, we'll need to actually shut down the server and not reboot. The setting that we changed in Proxmox doesn't apply unless the machine gets totally shut down. So let's shut it down. OK, now the machine's shut down. Now we'll power it back on. And we should see that the QEMU guest agent option is now turned on, rather than pending a status of enabled. Now the machine's back up and running. And if we go in the summary tab, we can see our IP information. So this is a good sign. This means it's working. This also gives us some optimizations as well as the option to do memory ballooning now. And we can explore that later, but let's go on to the next one. Next is the configuring a firewall. This will ensure that only the communication we allow will get through to the host. If we run sudo ufw status, we see that our firewall is inactive. So let's make some changes. First, we'll allow all outgoing. And next, we'll want to deny all incoming. Next, we'll want to allow incoming SSH. And if you're running SSH on a different port, you'll have to adjust this. Now, before we apply these firewall rules, make sure you have these set properly. Otherwise, you'll need physical access to it or physical virtual access to the console through Proxmox. But now this is getting weird. But anyway, make sure that these are the rules that you want to set before we enable it. So let's enable it. Say yes here. So now the firewall is active and enabled on system startup along with all of our rules. And if we want to check the status, we can run sudo ufw status. And here we can see our rules. So now the only incoming ports that are accepted are SSH. The next thing I install and configure is fail to ban. So fail to ban is a great utility. What it does is it scans your log files and looks for signs of malicious activity. And you can define what that malicious activity is, but we'll use it for password failures. So in our case, if it sees too many password failures on, say, SSH, it will update our firewall rules to reject that offender from our machine. And this is totally configurable. So let's get it set up. First, we'll update our repositories. Then we'll install fail to ban. Then we'll verify that the service is running. And you can see here it's active and running. So fail to ban comes with a couple of configuration files. And we're going to base our configuration off of those configuration files. We don't want to modify these directly just in case a future update wipes those out. First, we'll duplicate the fail to ban config to a local version. Then we'll do the same thing for the jail file. Then we'll modify the fail to ban local copy. Here, we'll want to make sure the log level is set to info. And we'll want to make sure our log target is bar log fail to ban dot log. So we'll save and exit out of here. Next, we'll modify the jail dot local. Here, we'll want to set the ban time. This is how long they're banned. Next, we'll want to set the find time. So this is the window it's going to look at for the logs to analyze whether or not it should ban someone. Then the max retry. So this is how many times the offender can attempt the action before they're banned. Then there's backend. And this is the backend it's going to use. For Ubuntu 2004, I've had to use systemd. So I've had to change it from auto to systemd. Then we'll save and exit out of here. Then we'll restart fail to ban. Then we'll get the status to make sure it's running. Then we'll query the status of fail to ban to make sure that our jail is set up. And by default, fail to ban will set one up for SSH. And you can see it here. 
And if we want to see the status for that specific jail, we can run sudo fail to ban dash client status sshd. And you can see here, no one's currently banned. And if we tail the log, we can see here that it was reconfigured and started up. Okay, so let's try to ban ourselves. So from another machine, I'm going to try to get ourselves banned by SSHing in. I'm using an account that doesn't exist along with the wrong SSH key. So if we generate some failed attempts for SSH, we can go back into fail to ban and check the logs. And if we check the logs, we can see that we're not getting banned. Now, this is to be expected. This is because fail to ban is actually looking for failed challenge attempts. And since we're using an SSH key to authenticate, we never get challenged. So I wanted to show this just in case you're using password-based authentication. And if you are, after these attempts, you'll see the account go up and then you'll get banned. And just to prove this, I'll turn password authentication back on. We'll restart SSH. We'll then try to SSH into that server. And just to prove this, we'll turn on password authentication and challenge response authentication. We'll set it to yes and we'll save. Then we'll restart SSH. Then we'll try to SSH into that server. Then we'll fail a password. Then eventually we'll get locked out. If I try to SSH in again, the connection was refused. Then if we look at the jail for SSHD, we can see here 16 total failed, one IP banned, and there's our IP. So again, if you're using key-based authentication, this won't really work because we never get the challenge and it never logs a failure. But if you are using a password, this is a nice way to ban the IPs of failure attempts. And also, this is not just for SSH. This works with many other services. And so this is one that I configure based on the service that's running on that machine. Okay, so I have two bonus items. Now, everybody likes a bonus and it wouldn't be a list if I didn't have a couple bonus items. But these are items you'll set up after your machine is running and after you dedicate a role to it. The first one is backups. Now setting up and configuring backups depends on the data that you're backing up as well as the system you're backing up to. A quick and easy way that I back up data from one machine to another is just using rsync and that securely transfers data over SSH to the destination machine. And again, this is something you'll configure after you've decided the role for your server. At this point, we don't know this server's role, so we may or may not have to configure backups, but I figured it was worth mentioning here. And the next bonus topic is a huge one, and that's remote logging and monitoring. So remote monitoring and logging is critical to the machine, and this will depend on the monitoring system that you're using. You might use a pull system, which is going to pull the data off the machine, or you might have a push system in place in which this machine will push log to a remote machine. And this is a huge topic in a lot of systems out there that will help you. There are things like Prometheus and FluentD, which can help you aggregate logs and monitor your systems. And this is a huge topic and not something I can include in a tutorial like this. But if this is something you want to see, let me know in the comments section below. And that's pretty much the end of my list. Those are all the things I do when setting up a new Linux server. Now worth mentioning, you might not take these manual steps every time you set up a machine. This might be something you script or automate with something like Ansible. Scripting or automating this is definitely the way to go. I showed you the manual steps so that you could take these, use these, and possibly automate it. And I'm sure there's things I missed or things that you care about. So what are the things you usually do when setting up a new Linux server? Are there additional configurations or agents or things you install when setting one up? Are there things that you wouldn't have done that maybe I shouldn't be doing in the future? If so, let me know in the comments section below. And if you have more questions, you can always join my live stream. I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so if you have a question about this video or any of my other videos, hop in my stream and I'd love to have you. So, thanks so much for watching and till next time, stream on my friends. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. Like, because um, we're, we're in the cloud too, so like I, I, I would get some digital like hand-me-down of what would be a server. And actually, yeah, yeah, I hear what you mean. Uh, Cause we, yeah, we, I mean, we don't even have servers. We're like all Kubernetes. So it's kind of like, man, we don't even, <laughs> we, I wouldn't even get anything. I would get some leftover container <laughs> that has some hash of some old code in it. That, that would be our throw out at work.